Hello everyone, this is Devin Thorpe and I'm a Forbes contributor and today I am really honored to have with us Gordon Gund who is a great entrepreneur, venture capitalist, uh, sports enthusiast and philanthropist. Uh, Gordon, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Well, I'm delighted. Thank you, Devin. Uh, Gordon, your personal mission seems to center around uh, fighting blindness. You established years ago a foundation called the Foundation Fighting Blindness and you are its chair and have been for many many years. Uh, tell us a little bit about your personal motivation for that. Fine. I, well, um, in the mid-60s I was uh, having started having a great deal of difficulty seeing at night and I finally got diagnosed by an ophthalmologist as having a disease, a retinal degenerative disease called retinitis pigmentosa, one of a family of inherited retinal degenerative diseases uh, that altogether affect more than 10 million people in the United States and many times that number worldwide. When I was first diagnosed, I began having a difficulty seeing at night, then uh, uh, progressively my night vision went and then my day vision from the periphery in, sort of from the outside in, like at the end, like seeing through a straw before all of it disappeared in 1970. My wife and I had during that time looked all over for a way to stop the progress of the disease and a way to treat it or cure it and there was almost no research going on then and uh, very little known about the disease I have and, and the whole family of retinal degenerations. So after we kind of started putting the pieces of our lives back together again. We both agreed that we wanted to do something, having had this very frustrating, difficult experience, that we wanted to make something positive out of it and, and wanted to do what we could to assure that someday uh, families that had children diagnosed with the diseases that I have one of would not have to face the same terrible and difficult time that, that we'd gone through. So in the fall of 1971, we started with some other families. So we're co-founders with a, a number of others of what we call the Foundation Fighting Blindness at that time. In the early days, it was the National Retinitis Pigmentosa Foundation, changed its name uh, many years ago to the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And its mission from the very beginning was uh, to do the research necessary Necessary to build the base of knowledge about these diseases, about the retina, and about what causes these diseases, so that we could reach a critical mass of knowledge sufficient to allow us to start uh, developing treatments and cures, researchers that we identified and funded. And that's been our steadfast focus, and I'm happy to say that now, because of that focus and the persistence in that mission over decades, we are now at a point where we have a portfolio of tremendous advances that have taken place, some real breakthroughs, and we're in the area of clinical trials. So we have more than 15 clinical trials going on with different in different research areas that we've funded over the years. Very exciting time. It's, this is wonderful, wonderful stuff. I want to just take people back in time just a little bit and put put your current efforts into some context. You are. Uh, you and your brother launched together the expansion team, the San Jose Sharks. That's right. And for and many you. years, you were the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. You recruited LeBron James. You, you've had a successful career as a venture capitalist. Just give us a sense of how your career has developed. Uh, well, I started in the. Well, I still had my eyesight. I I had been in the. I was a commercial lender for the Chase, and then going to business school at night at NYU in the, in the mid-60s after I got out of the Navy. I'd been an officer in the Navy out in the, in the Western Pacific. And when I came back and had that uh, education, then I decided what I really liked was venturing and wanted to, be, wanted to work with entrepreneurs and, and help finance them. And I joined forces with some other people who know, knew more about that then than I did. And we started a company that I continue to do venturing in a, in a less formal way and have throughout my life. And I think professional sports are a lot like that too. But where this has really helped me with, uh, with my efforts with the Foundation Fighting Blindness is that I, I had this mindset that uh, if we could get, if we could seed innovative new ideas 
and initiate uh, new ways of, of doing research or new forms of research to understand these, these diseases and what caused them, uh, that, we could, that we could really uh, get to where we could get a lot of leverage by, by bringing those opportunities to the government once they'd reached a certain, once the risk uh, had been, or well, they'd been de-risked to some extent, then sure. we could uh, be attractive to governmental uh, sources of funding and venture capital and pharma funding as well. So always in, with the idea of, of starting things, getting them off the ground, providing seed capital, and then, and then uh, moving them to more conventional sources of funding. So let's talk a little bit now about how that, that venturing spirit applies in the blindness fighting arena because there are a number of very promising technologies that you've told me about a little bit. Uh, uh, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, sight uh, restoring technologies like the Argus 2, optogenetics, uh, drugs and nutrition and neurotrophic factors. Tell us, see if you, can you synthesize for a minute where we are in this fight against blindness and and how soon we could potentially see cures to blindness? Well, happily, we are in the era of clinical trials. And as you know, in order to get um, uh, therapies and treatments and cures to the people who need them in any case of any health research, you have to get FDA approval in, in the United States in order to uh, have those commercially available in the marketplace. And that's key to the ultimate delivery of, of any therapy. So we're now in the clinical trials phase, which means we've come through the laboratory with proof of concept, come through what's called the valley of death, where you have to uh, qualify these things in a lot of ways before the FDA will e even begin to let you try them in humans. We're now, we now have 15 trials of these various therapies in humans. Uh, one where uh, dozens of children and young adults who were born blind with a very severe form of, of retinitis pigmentosa um, were able by having uh, one gene therapy trial to have significant amounts of sight restored. One boy who was only eight years old when he had the trial was able to put away his white cane and start playing baseball. I mean, it, it's remarkable uh, what gene therapy is now doing and we have several trials uh, for a number of diseases, including uh, including um, Usher's disease and Stargardt's disease, the juvenile form of macular degeneration, that are going on uh, right now. Choroideremia is another. And I should mention that this family of diseases we're working on is called retinal degenerative, they're all called retinal degenerative diseases. They affect more than 10 million people in the United States, many times that number around the world. Uh, and they and they all have a lot a, a lot in common, uh, including a disease called age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of blindness for people over 55 yeah, in the United States. My father has that. Okay, so you so you're aware of it. Well, because these therapies now many of these are 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 genetically based. They're inherited diseases. Not all of them. Some have inherited inherited tendencies but aren't directly uh, genetic, but, uh, but that, all, that comes into play with all of them. And we've, we've started early on to begin to identify those genes. The first uh, one was identified by researchers we funded in 1989, and since then we've identified more than 200 uh, genes that, that cause these diseases, gene defects or mutations. Uh, that's, and, and now we, that's led the way to gene therapy where we can actually reverse that situation uh, and have been successful, as I say, in, in one trial that has led to dozens of people regaining significant amounts of sight. We've also uh, done, are doing this now with, uh, with stem cell therapies and, and a variety of kinds of stem cell therapy where in some cases you can take Hum, uh, adult skin cells or cells from the, from blood and and uh, and turn them into uh, flourishing neuro uh, neuro neurological cells like like uh, uh, the rods and cones the uh, the vision uh, the sight receiving cells of the eye so there's a lot of uh, opportunity with stem cells that's now work that we're doing and some already is in clinical trial I'm happy to say uh, also. Pharmaceutical uh, 
companies we're working with to, de to develop a variety of drugs that can slow or halt the, the progress of these diseases. And there are nutritional factors that are available too. In the, in the device side, where we've actually worked with a company called Argus 2, that, or called Second Sight, that just had a commercially approved by the FDA, the Argus 2 device that makes it possible for people who don't see at all, it's like a bionic eye or a bionic retina, to actually um, be able to see light and, and, uh, and, and develop shadows uh, and motion so they can actually get much better motivational ca capabilities. They can move around better, mobility, uh, and certainly a lot more uh, confidence. Right, right. Well, this is all exciting. Uh, the, the, we're, we're right at the cusp here of, of seeing are. these things happen. Uh, how much more money is, is required to, to get us over that threshold to where uh, uh, curing uh, these diseases, restoring vision is routine? Well, it's, uh, it's going to come. And that's the exciting thing. We really are on the cusp. In fact, I guess I like to think we've crossed over the threshold now with what's happening and, and, and the clinical trials that are going on. And we certainly need, we're, we're significantly increasing the amount of funds we're trying to raise uh, to, to, to get, to keep initiating new, very promising ideas and keeping the pipeline uh, for clinical trials and for future therapies, treatments and cures filled up so that uh, so we can keep moving new ideas and new things forward to eventually to the patients who need them. It's going to take a lot of funding, uh, not only money that we raise, and I think for any ph philanthropist out there who's interested in funding something that's really getting the job done that it's set out to do, we're, we're in the business of going out of business. So we're, we're uh, very passionate about this and and are really doing it, I think, as, as in as accelerated a way as we can and as, in as effective and efficient a way as possible. So, we're, so we, get, we keep the things moving. We're also going to need uh, biotech uh, companies to pick up some of this, venture capital companies and pharmaceutical companies as we squeeze the risk out, as we make it less risky for them to pick up some of these therapies that are in human studies and move move them forward to commercialization. That's, that's going to take a lot of money because clinical trials cost a great deal. Each one, 10 to $20 million or maybe more, in order to get, <clears throat> get all the way through to where the FDA approves the commercialization of, of the therapy. Well, what, where should philanthropists be focusing their money? Well, I would like to think that, to begin with, philanthropists should focus it on the Foundation Fighting Blindness. We're really the leader, of, the private leader in this field. We, we do all we can to leverage that money. So to assure that, first of all, uh, on every dollar they give us most of it, close to 80%, between 75 and 80% goes right to the research we're talking about. And we also do our best to ensure that we get as much leverage. So. For example, there are governments uh, in, in the un United States, we have the National Institutes of Health, and one of those is the National Eye Institute, which was founded, ironically, just a year before we were, uh, so 43 years ago, we're 42 years old now, and we work very closely with them. We have a real partnership with them, and as we take the risk out of things, early stage research, as we develop, bring in new people, young investigators, both clinicians and, and basic scientists into the field, as soon as those people establish some track record, the National Eye Institute will pick them up. And I think over the, over the years, we've gotten uh, probably seven, uh, seven times the, the leverage of probably seven times the money we've put in, the National Eye Institute has put in alongside us to further the work that, that we've seeded to begin with. So we'll give dramatic leverage to any film of, philanthropic revenue we receive, any, any donations uh, that we receive. I also think from an entrepreneurial or a venture capital standpoint, um, we have a capability now, Devin, to, uh, to, to fund, and we do this, a number of, of uh, researchers are starting small companies, virtual companies, and we'll work with them 
we fund them alongside venture capital companies so we can provide access to good opportunities for venture capital companies. Uh, and, and they have the imprimatur of our scientific advisory board. We, we have a, uh, a major resource in a world-class scientific advisory board, people from Harvard, from Johns Hopkins. We also fund research centers at those places and a University of California, San Francisco, the University of Pennsylvania, on and on. Centers all over the world, our work is 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 worldwide but also so so is the is the opportunity for funding well uh, what are the opportunities for investors now as you de-risk and commercialize this technology clearly there are opportunities for people to participate in a profitable way in uh, in developing uh, these technologies and bringing them to the tens of millions of people in the world who would use them Absolutely, and of course, that's got to be there in order to deliver these opportunities, these therapies to the patients who need them. You have to commercialize it, and there has to be a, a significant profit opportunity in order for investment to come in. We work closely with venture capital companies and biotech companies uh, in in uh, in providing opportunities for them to fund very promising research research that. Our, our work has helped bring along to begin with. And in fact, we're working with a number of them. And the great thing to see is that some companies like Applied Gen uh, Gen Genetics Technologies and, and, uh, and, and Gene Sight and some others that we've funded to start with have in recent years, in fact, within the last year, two of these companies, the two I mentioned, have raised more than $90 million of venture capital to, to carry forward the work that we help to fund. So we're we're very much, thanks to this scientific advisory board, on top of the best opportunities in the field for investors, and, and we'll work with them, and, and we'll fund early on alongside them to make sure uh, that it gets as much leverage as possible. Fantastic. What do you see as being the role of government? You talked about how the National uh, was it the National Institute of Blindness? Had, it was National uh, Eye Institute. Yeah, National Eye Institute was was invested. I presume that's a government agency, and, and you're getting is, government it, dollars there. It is, and it's one of the National Institutes of Health. And we've raised, let's say, probably uh, over our 42-year history now, over 550 million dollars for this research that we've raised through our. We have a network of 50 chapters around the country, and thousands and thousands of volunteers. And, and the government, the National Institute, as I mentioned earlier, has probably funded, in addition to that, maybe seven times that, over $3 billion over the years that have gone into this work that, that, we're, that we're funding. Uh, so they've been tremendously helpful. There are other governments around the world that uh, are certainly much very aware of this because of the huge social impact of these diseases. Uh, and actually recently uh, the government of Israel funded a project we're doing there uh, that we are funding there in, in the stem cell field that looks very promising. They put in a million three hundred thousand into that. That's uh, wonderful. Uh, what, when you think about the role the FDA plays in bringing new technologies, new drugs to market, is there something you'd change about the way they operate, or are you well, happy we, with that process? We, we work closely with them, Devin, and, and uh, are very grateful to them. Our, our missions are the same. We want safe, effective therapies provided to patients who have uh, retinal degenerative diseases. So we, we want to work with the FDA, and we do closely, and, and uh, we're working with them not only um, to, in, in terms of new therapies, but also in helping to develop new endpoints, ways to measure successful, the success of therapies and, the, and to hasten the speed of, of those measurements so we can get more drugs out to patients more quickly. So we're working with them on the development of endpoints too. And uh, we have regular meetings with them about progress being made on all the fronts that we're involved in. So whether it's gene therapy or stem cell therapy or neurotrophic factors or or uh, pharmaceutical drugs, uh, and and uh, and any number of things that we're working on, we'll we'll work closely with them all the while. Great. 
I think there must be some opportunities in this mix for entrepreneurs. Perhaps it's researchers, but what do you see as being the opportunities for for people to as in a sort of an entrepreneurial way to participate in this problem or, or in the solution more more aptly? Well, I would I would hope that they'd see an opportunity uh, to get involved with with our work because what we do is very entrepreneurial. We try and bring uh, researchers together uh, with with industry, um, with venture capital companies, uh, with volunteers. I mean, any number of ways they could become involved with us. And I think researchers certainly I mentioned earlier are becoming very entrepreneurial, and, and I would hope that would be an area people would, uh, researchers would be looking at. But as far as entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial people generally, we, we would very much like to work with them, and uh, both from an investment and from a volunteer standpoint. So there are a lot of ways that we're doing that right now that they could be part of. I, one one uh, other thought that's kind of related to that is I think about young people who uh, come of age now and look at this uh, really ripe field and say, well, I want to participate in this. I want to be a part of this solution. What should they be studying in college? What What fields are the relevant fields, the most promising fields for really being a part of the cure for blindness? Well, I, I, I think certainly biology, if they're, depending on when they're starting and, and becoming clinicians or medical doctors or basic scientists uh, in, in the field of molecular biology, uh, genetics, uh, any in neurology, certainly uh, neurological systems, understanding uh, those things and applying them is a, is a terrific way to become involved. Also studying uh, ways uh, not-for-profit management, if they want to come in uh, that end of it, that would be great too. There are so many ways to get involved and I, it is interesting to watch how now young people are really turning to what we're doing. They, they feel where we are headed. They feel that there is, this is really an exciting place to be now and things are really happening that are going to eventually eradicate these diseases from the face of the world. They want to be part of that and we welcome them. I think another way for young people to be involved again is as volunteers. As I mentioned, we have a network of 50 chapters around the country. We do walks and all kinds of fundraising events, and we're, we're very involved with helping families who, uh, who, are, who, who first have children diagnosed with these diseases, and we're in touch with them on a daily basis, and there's a way to help uh, bring them in and help make them feel part of the solution that of the problem they're facing. Sure. Well, um, as we think about bringing uh, our society along to support, encourage, uh, and activate all of the potential that uh, you're cultivating, uh, it begs the question of, of values and that what what should what should we be teaching our young people? What should we? What values should we be adopting ourselves that would be more uh, that would better facilitate and, and catalyze the solutions to to uh, blindness? Well, I, th I think first of all, the impact of these diseases uh, uh, is felt daily by hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, we hear from them all the time. Uh, families that have just had children diagnosed or the fact that it, it affects uh, not only young people but adolescents and and uh, older people who lose their independence, people with age-related macular degeneration, for example, uh, and it's it's understanding that uh, that that by helping what we're doing will help eventually help those people because hopefully we are and I know we're on the verge of finding treatments and cures for them, so that's that's one way to help them and to be aware of another, there's a real social burden of these problems, not just on, on the people, the families and people who have them, uh, but also on society in general. I, I think recently Prevent Blindness America came out with a survey that uh, indicates that something like $139 billion a year is spent 
uh, supporting and helping people who are visually impaired and blind, that's, that's huge. And if we can reduce that number significantly by virtue of finding treatments and cures to these diseases, we will have done something tremendous. Another, uh, another value is collaboration. And I think what we, what we espouse and really in, in assist, insist on is amongst our researchers that, is that they collaborate with each other that we get as much leverage through collaboration as possible. And I think that's an important value that, that all of us need. I think as far as um, volunteerism, I think it, it, everybody knows that, that if you do that, it can be, can be really satisfying and rewarding to you, the volunteer, as well, when something is making as much progress as we are and as we have in the offing. Uh, I think also philanthropically to support in any way you can, whether it's a, a team and a walk or however, is very important. Our website is fightblindness.org, and please check it out, everybody, and, and see how you might be able to help us. We're on the way and on the verge of some very major things in terms of, of ending blindness, so we need the, all the help we can get. Now, the foundation website is, <clears throat> is blindness.org, is that right? Yes. And uh, fightblindness.org. Fightingblindness.org. Okay. Well, just fightblindness.org. Yes. Fight. Good. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. But uh, Gordon, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, uh, it's a pleasure, Devin. I, I really appreciate the chance to talk about. As you can tell, I'm I'm not a little bit enthusiastic about the opportunities we have in front of us. It's it's been 42 years, but all all of it now really seems so worthwhile because of where we are and what, what, what's coming down the pike very soon. It, it is exciting to be a part of the solution. I can only imagine. And I hope that more people will join you in the effort so that uh, not only you'll be successful, but they'll be able to feel what, it, what you feel to be a part of a solution to such a big world problem. So thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you, Devin. All righty. Let's do some good.